Um, welcome everybody uh, to our uh, SE290 seminar series. Uh, today we're having a, uh, a special event as part of the, the, our seminar series as we have uh, the Friedman family visiting professional uh, visiting today or in, at least virtually uh, to UCSD. Uh, typically as part of this uh, program um, when we host a, a, a Friedman family visiting professional we have the seminar in addition to various activities throughout the day. And uh, you may have noticed that for today's seminar, I sent out uh, in addition an agenda with many different items that, that uh, uh, opportunities to meet with the speaker. And I encourage you to take advantage of those, including uh, we'll have more detailed discussion on the presentation right after uh, today's talk, all in the same uh, Zoom link. So be sure to, uh, to stay tuned. We're gonna have activities maybe going on to like 3.30 or four o'clock. Um, and uh, it's an excellent opportunity to meet um, a leading uh, structural engineer in the field and uh, learn about his experience. Earlier today, we were talking a little bit more about his career path and just, you know, very, very uh, uh, eye-opening for, 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 for a lot of us to, to you know, hear, hear, uh, um, to hear from, from, uh, from our speaker today. And uh, our speaker today, uh, well, um, we'll have someone else do the introduction. But I just will just mention that it is uh, David Friedman, as you can see from the presentation, and there is a direct relationship to the uh, name of the, of the, of the program, uh, the Friedman Family Visiting uh, a Program. Uh, and this is all uh, organized by EERI. And uh, as part of this event, we are going to have uh, uh, one of our, our student leaders from uh, EERI uh, make, the, make the presentation. So we have Khalid, who is a fourth year engineer, uh, engineering PhD student at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, um, uh, make the uh, make the presentation uh, of of our of our seminar speaker today. So Khalid. Uh, yeah. T thank you. Thank you, Professor Gilberto. It's my honor to be a moderator for this lecture. So the topic of uh, today's. Uh, our presentation is the practice of structural and earthquake engineering today and the three unique structural engineering projects. As Gilberto uh, mentioned, we have uh, David Friedman um, as uh, our guest speaker. He's uh, officially retired from uh, Foral Elsesser Engineers and uh, he has like uh, 40 plus years of experience. He served as a past president, CEO, and uh, chair of the board of uh, uh, chair of the board. Uh, of uh, the same company. As an engineer of record and the principal in charge, he oversaw more than 400 uh, seismic retrofit and construction projects. And uh, uh, some of the numerous uh, projects uh, include um, uh, the uh, seismic retrofit of uh, uh, San Francisco City Hall, which included uh, the base isolation. And uh, uh, another project is like the UC Berkeley uh, Stadium uh, which was remodeled, and uh, there was there was an innovative seismic safety corrections made to, uh, uh, to to the stadium. So these are just a few things. Uh, but David has, David David is also a member, and uh, uh, he has also chaired a lot of other uh, a lot of various organizations. So uh, he is also the uh, immediate past uh, director board of directors of ERI, as you all as uh, Gilberto mentioned earlier that um, uh, this, uh, the name, the Friedman Family Directors uh, itself is uh, ascribed to, to David because uh, of uh, their con the, the family's contribution uh, through funds and endowment. So it's, it's a great uh, honor for us to have him as uh, our, uh, our guest lecturer. So um, a couple of instructions before I hand over it to, to David. So, uh, First, uh, please keep your uh, mics turned off during the lecture. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, write it in the chat, chat box. And uh, after the lecture is finished, uh, I will ask those questions uh, uh, to David. And if there are any questions left, uh, we would send it to David and he can um, uh, respond to those questions. Uh, with that, uh, uh, David, I would uh, ask you to Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's, it's nice to be here uh, virtually. I, I, I wish I was on campus with you, but um, hopefully I can invite myself down sometime in the future when, when COVID allows. I'm actually just uh, 
last Friday had my my second uh, vaccine shot, um, so I think I'm I'm well well on my way. Uh, but but we all need herd immunity to to help us along. But it's uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I know a lot about the the UCSD program and and um, uh, feel honored to be asked to um, uh, to speak to you. Uh, you know, it's kind of an, an interesting position that I sit in because I'm, I am just newly officially retired from for LL Sessor engineers after being with them for 40 years. Um, as my wife said, it's either a testament to stamina or a lack of imagination. But I, um, I, I think there's only a couple of things you really need to know about me is, you know, I have thoroughly enjoyed my career. Um, uh, I've, I've worked with the nicest people, the best people, um, and uh, it, it's, I'm very bullish on this profession uh, of structural and earthquake engineering. Um, uh, I, I also, um, earthquakes have kind of shaped my career. Um, and uh, I, I guess one of the things, even here I am at the end of my career and you all are at the beginning of your career. What could I impart to you all uh, that would be meaningful? And it's and it's just really uh, kind of this story of, of my perspective and some of these projects that have kept me on just a wonderful continuous learning curve. Um, that is, I think, a testament to, uh, to the profession. Um, uh, I, I have been, um, you know, for some reason, I am not able to advance the slide. Well, let me try here. Oh, there we go. Um, so this is kind of a public service announcement about EERI um, that, that brings me to you. Um, uh, I've been involved with EERI for probably 30 years as a member. Um, you probably know it as a dedication to um, uh, global uh, earthquake risk reduction. Um, uh, the reason that EERI's mission is so effective is because it's a it's a melting pot of um, many different engineering uh, disciplines. Uh, so you get to rub elbows and brains with uh, geotechnical engineers and lifeline engineers and seismologists and uh, social scientists. Um, and I think it's a very broadening perspective. Um, here's all the different kinds of people who are EERI members. There are special projects of EERI. The School Seismic Safety Initiative is, is one of my favorites, but really the favorite is learning from earthquakes because the learning from earthquake program for me really changed the entire um, perspective of my career. It was just a, it was a game changer. And it was because it gave me a worldly view of what, what earthquakes can do um, and what the challenge is in terms of earthquake risk reduction. Um, there are, uh, because we can't all always be on a reconnaissance team. Uh, we do have new programs. That is a travel study program, which has been very effective once we can all travel again. Um, there are lots of uh, uh, membership benefits to students. Um, I know a, a lot of people have said to me, well, I'm not really following a path in earthquake engineering. Um, so why should I stay involved in EERI? I think I've found that even if you're an environmental engineer, that that the, the learning from earthquakes has been very valuable to, to a lot of people. Um, there are benefits after graduation as well. Um, uh, and I highly, uh, encourage you to get involved in, in regional chapters, uh, which is really a, a growing activity of, um, of EERI. Um, so that's the, that's the end of my public service announcement for EERI, but um, it is what brings me to you today. Um, and 
um, I hope you not only enjoy today, but every year take advantage of the Visiting Professional Program. So um, my career, as, as I've said, it's, um, uh, uh, I'm at the tail end of it. Um, here's a, uh, I have uh, four timeline slides that I superimpose through this. Um, uh, I've had only three jobs in my entire career. Um, uh, two years, three years, and then 40 years. Um, and you can see kind of the, um, you know, kind of my progression through uh, being a, just a project engineer and a principal, uh, CEO, board chair. You know, I was one of those people that had no interest whatsoever in the management of the firm. You know, I wasn't one of these who said, you know, I want to be CEO of the firm, but I found myself on a wonderful learning curve and, uh, and, and did um, enjoy growing the firm, bringing in work, um, and, and bringing in the types of projects where uh, that, that we all found so stimulating along the way. Um, earthquakes had a major impact uh, on, on, on my career. And here's the timeline again with uh, kind of, uh, you know, a lot of earthquakes that were milestones um, uh, for engineers or for me. Um, uh, the ones highlighted in yellow is when I was on a an EERI reconnaissance team, um, and and those were those were game changers for me. But a lot of these other ones were also ones that I learned a great deal about. Um, you know, kind of not just to show a lot of damage slides, but you know, the, we do learn a lot from chasing earthquakes around the world. No, I wasn't alive during this earthquake, uh, in 1906. Um, magnitude 7.8, but, but I did work on the successor um, city hall that was built just across the Civic Center Plaza. You know, this, this uh, earthquake was, was very damaging, but was really damaging because of the fire that, was, that occurred uh, as a result of the earthquake. Um, 1971, the San Fernando earthquake, um, this was also quite a game changer in terms of code development. Uh, when I started my career, the seismic provisions in the code were probably 10 pages long. Today, it's probably 10 times uh, that length. But the, uh, the Silmar earthquake was, was, um, was really important for a couple of reasons. This photograph is of um, of the Olive View Hospital, our codes relative to hospital construction as, um, as uh, emergency facilities and essential facilities, um, uh, kind of the, the closure of this hospital. Uh, and, and you'll see kind of the lack of ductility in those columns. I would say that was another imprint of this earthquake was we, we began talking much, much more about ductility. Um, and the need for ductility and design. Um, Loma Prieta was, was um, not a big earthquake, actually. Uh, it was maybe big for Santa Cruz, but for San Francisco, it was not. Um, it was only eight seconds of, of strong grain. Um, I, I think if the earthquake was, was twice as long, the damage would have been, would have been fantastically more, um, uh, more damaging. But the, um, the, the other thing about, you know, this earthquake had an imprint on my career because the number of times I've had clients say to me, but my building survived through the big one, why do I need to retrofit it? You know, and I said, your, your, your building was, was around in 1906? No, 1989. You know, it just was not a big earthquake. You know, and I think it it actually did did us a real disservice in a way. Uh, Northridge earthquake in in uh, 1994 was significant. Then Kobe, Japan. You know, this 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 was a uh, as I mentioned was a um, uh, one of the first reconnaissance trips I did with EERI, and and this photo of the Henshin Freeway which was a, a concrete viaduct structure. Those, those columns are 27 feet in diameter. Um, and, and 
it, it, it taught me a valuable lesson in, in terms of brute force approach to uh, uh, earthquake resistance doesn't work. Again, you know, if you can see in the foreground that one big pier, um, the uh, transverse reinforcing was 18 inches apart. So there was almost no ductility. Uh, the Banda Ache earthquake in 2004, um, big earthquake in terms of magnitude, but this is, this is when we all really started paying attention to tsunamis. Really, we, we as, a, as a profession, there wasn't, we knew tsunamis existed, but this was really the first that had a really big impact. Um, uh, uh, and I don't think it was until well after this along the coast of California that we started seeing um, uh, um, tsunami warnings along the, along the coast. Um, Wenchuan, China was another reconnaissance trip I was on. Uh, death toll here was significant. Um, the earthquake induced landslides were, um, uh, were quite the story of this earthquake. Um, some much bigger than the ones that are, that are shown in the background, um, but, but took out a number of cities and villages um, in, in this rural earthquake. Um, Haiti was, was, was a heartbreaker, you know, it was a heartbreaker because of not that we learned a lot about kind of technical engineering design, but the loss from this earthquake was um, measured at two and a half times the gross national project, product of, of the country. You know, it's just devastating to the country, which is why the country is uh, honestly, 10 years later is still recovering uh, from this earthquake. Um, and Christchurch is, is another one, which is a, you know, a fascinating earthquake because New Zealand has great engineering, great codes. There, you might recall there, there were two earthquakes within six months of one another. Um, the, the second one, the 6.3, was actually the smaller of the two earthquakes in terms of Richter magnitude, but ju this just happened right below the central business district of, um, uh, of Christchurch. And the damage today in the central business district, 10 years later, is still profound. Um, so these earthquakes all, you know, had uh, a massive effect on my career. So um, a couple of thoughts about the practice of structural engineering. This is one of my favorite quotes about structural engineering as a definition. Structural engineering is the art of molding materials we do not entirely understand into shapes we cannot precisely analyze so as to withstand forces we cannot really assess in such a way that the community at large has no reason to suspect the, the extent of our ignorance. Now, it, it's kind of whimsical because we're certainly not ignorant, but I do think it does, it does point out that we deal with so much, you know, we're, we're involved in such science and such formula and such you know, kind of modeling and theory and stuff. Yet there really is a lot of uncertainty to what we're what what we're doing, and I think that needs to. We need to get people to understand that a little bit more. Um, the issues facing uh, practicing engineers today, um, the codes keep changing, and the, you know I think they're changing for the better for the most part. And and you know as I mentioned that. From chasing earthquakes around the world, we we learn certain things and we and we codify them, um, you know. But the, the the building code isn't perfect, you know. It's 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 based really for regular buildings like the one on the left, but I don't know any architects who want to really design buildings like that. They want to design buildings on the right, you know. And and th that's important to keep in mind as you're reading and working with the code and you're and you're modeling uh, the code. Um, the code is also its seismic provisions is based upon a minimum standard. Think about that for a minute. It's a minimum standard, not a maximum standard. It's a minimum standard. And that minimum standard is life safety. Life safety means what to a building designer? It means that people after an earthquake 
can safely exit the building does not mean that they can get back in the building. The building can be red tagged. The building can be a total economic loss, but that's a code conforming design. So what's a code conforming design in this little pictogram? It would be this. It would be a moderate disruption. And I don't think building by building, you would have to be able to, um, you would have to define whether or not it was an economic loss uh, and was a throwaway or if it, it could actually be, be retrofitted. But I think of the public at large thinks that if you get a code design building, you get this. You get the fully operational building, which as we know that you don't get. You know, so that's where the buzzword now that we talk about more and more is resilience. You know, and we talk at the beginning of a project with a building owner um, and the architects and say, what is the performance objective? We can do a code design building, but understand this is what you're gonna get. Um, and, and most people will say, no, we don't, we don't want the moderate, the, the moderate disruption. So we start talking a little bit more about the, um, um, the, the enhanced seismic performance of the building. Um, you know, contemporary architecture, you know, forces us to be creative thinkers about in our structural engineering. This is a, the Frank Geary um, uh, Museum in, uh, in LA. You know, th these are the types of buildings that uh, we get called on to come up with rational engineering designs. And I think the best structural engineers are in earthquake country because we have to figure out how to, how to insert the lateral systems into these configurations. This is a building in Europe. This isn't a post-earthquake damage state of the building, but this is what modern architects like, like doing. Um, uh, so you have to get ready to, to be able to analyze, model, design these kinds of buildings. You know, a couple of things that I've learned along the way, because a lot of the projects that I worked on were large significant seismic retrofits, seismic retrofits of historic landmark buildings. Normally the engineer does not get involved in um, the stability of the building during the course of construction. Uh, we put that responsibility on the contractor and we call it means and methods of construction. But in the case of San Francisco City Hall, we knew that not only would the construction last two and a half years? But the client was pretty worried about keeping its investment in its in its building um, uh, kind of stable during the course of construction. If we had left it up to the contractor, they may have thrown in a little bit of rod bracing or something that just would not have done the trick. So sometimes we do cross that line and get involved in making sure there is temporary shoring, bracing uh, um, in the mix uh, so that if there is an earthquake during the course of construction that the building is um, uh, protected. Um, Engineers of record are also have a role during the course of construction. We call it construction administration. We re review the contract drawings, uh, the production drawings, uh, the shop drawings, we call them. Um, but we're not special inspectors, but we go out to the job site occasionally uh, just to make sure the construction is following the intent of our drawings. And sometimes we find things we don't like like that concrete joist in the background should have been aligned with the one in the foreground. Now, in this case, it didn't really make a difference, but you know, it's kind of like, this is kind of funny, but, but how can someone make a mistake like that? Then here's another example of, you know, we didn't know this until they took the, all the false work around, but that column was actually supposed to be plumb. You know, um, you know, and it's just kind of like, you know, contractors don't always do things right. Here you're looking at the underside of a concrete slab as it connects to um, a wall on one side and a concrete beam on the other. Um, we have a typical detail that was ignored of, on, on the number of concrete sleeves that could go through a slab. I mean, that's kind of, can you imagine 
how little shear capacity there is in that slab at that point. And this, this was under construction and we had to stick a steel beam in there to, to reinforce it. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about sustainability. It was a, a particular interest to, to me um, and to the firm as we um, uh, had, an, had an interest in sustainability. What could we as structural engineers add to this? Uh, that first bullet at the bottom, high volume fly, fly ash concrete. We, you know, we st started replacing in our mixed designs, much more fly ash for Portland cement. Um, uh, but we, you know, we, what, what uh, unfortunately the sustainability movement missed, it was more about energy than it was about seismic sustainability. Um, I've gotten involved in the U.S. Resilience Council, a, um, um, a, uh, a rating system whereby we can uh, help evaluate, put a star system on, on good seismic performing systems. But I think this is where, uh, where the profession is going, you know, in terms of trying to populate our communities, which much more seismically resilient buildings. Um, because of that issue of, um, of uncertainty about what we do, it, it really puts us engineers in the position of we really need to be good speakers and good writers. And we have a hard task because what it is we do is, um, is fairly complex. And, and uh, we, we, we can't necessarily speak like engineers all the time or write like engineers because we have to realize our audience is a lay audience. So we have to discuss things like seismic performance in the ways that people can understand. And I think this is a very important thing for practicing engineers. So now some of the projects, um, we're gonna, these, this is the best part of what I wanted to talk about, but you know, kind of this is where a lot of kind of what I learned on projects and how projects themselves have a light life of their own and they each have unique challenges uh, along the way. Uh, those two long running bars are two of the projects I'm gonna talk about, San Francisco City Hall and the UC Berkeley projects. Um, you know, but you know, a lot of my projects were all affected, impacted by by those earthquakes in some way, shape, or form. Most of these were um, seismic retrofits. Some are new construction, but you know, new construction like at San Francisco Airport, at San Francisco Airport essentially treated its buildings as, as essential services buildings. So the first project is the base isolation retrofit of San Francisco City Hall. So I know some of you know some about uh, uh, base isolation, but I think I will, I will give a very quick primer on, on base isolation. Um, there are basically three different kinds of isolators. I mean, isolators were they had already been invented. They were basically bridge bearings, but they hadn't necessarily been used in an aseismic kind of application. Um, uh, there are two elastomeric kinds, the upper two, a high damping rubber, um, and then the, uh, the lead core rubber, which is added damping um, within, within the, um, uh, the elastomeric isolator. If you don't know, these are, these are basically layers of steel plates and rubber and steel plates uh, vulcanized, kind of melded together. Um, their, their size varies, but they're, they're approximately 24 inches tall. And, you know, in most cases, 24 to 36 inches in diameter, the friction pendulum. And that's, that's a kind of, a, there's now a triple friction pendulum, um, but it, it operates on a kind of a, a sliding uh, steel against steel and a concave, uh, concave shape. You know, these, can, these have a, a lower height profile, um, but can be as much as six feet square approximately. Um, they, they vary. We're kind of agnostic on the topic of, you know, which isolators are the best. The vendors aren't agnostic on it. And a lot of the, 
the public sector projects, we have to write a performance spec where uh, both types of isolators, all types of isolators uh, can, be, can be considered. There are two basic reasons why we base isolate buildings. Um, one is, is depicted in this slide, a fixed base building, you know, and anything other than an isolated building is a fixed base building. It's a shear wall or brace frame building. And you can see what's pictured on the left is, is the, uh, the way the building drifts, story to story, interstory drift. Uh, and that interstory drift is what creates damage. You know, um, and in fact, you know, kind of earthquake engineering 101, we want the buildings to move because that's what dissipates the energy of the earthquake or the systems we put in are the systems that have to absorb that energy and dissipate the energy. But in the case on the right of a base isolated building, all that deformation is really, or most of the deformation, maybe, you know, two thirds of it is happening in the isolator. You know, and look at the, the 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 rest of the superstructure. It's moving much more monolithically. You know, it's moving it's moving as a block, much less interstory drift, and that's what protects the damage to the building. The other reason we base isolate buildings is because of the period shift. So in this response spectrum, you know, you probably this is basic stuff that most of the the buildings that um, that we design are in the half a second to one second period and and look where that places us within the response spectrum you know we get a we get the spectral acceleration of you know over 1.0 g but with base isolation there's the period shift and that that shift is you know out into the two and a half to three second range and then you read over to the spectral acceleration uh, and and you get you know, 0.2 G, you know, so this is a huge advantage to, um, to what you have to design for the lateral force resistance of the, um, um, uh, of the superstructure of the building. Uh, the very first project that Pharrell Alcesser did uh, was the city county building in Salt Lake City. We did that in 1985. Um, uh, it's a stone building. Uh, um, in 1988, we went to the building department in San Francisco and we said, we said um, base isolation is, is probably the right way to protect um, uh, City Hall from, from an earthquake. And they listened and they said, what's base isolation? Has it been proven? Where else has it been used? And at the end of the conversation, they said, very interesting, go away. And then they called us back nine months later, right after Loma Prieta and said, let's talk. And that's how we got started on, on San Francisco City Hall. Um, this is the new City Hall um, that was built in 1950 after the, the collapse of the, um, uh, the City Hall in the 1906 earthquake. Um, uh, this is what happened to the to city hall. So this is essentially what we did. Um, and and if you look down at the bottom of the slide, you'll see in blue a new foundation system, a strengthened foundation system, and then you'll see kind of uh, white space with the little isolators pictured in there. So cr we created this this isolation plane um, and we created uh, a new diaphragm on top of that. And I'll, I'll explain that to you a little bit better, but that, that was not all we had to do. We had to put concrete shear walls up through the light courts. So it's in the interior of the, of the building flanking each side of the rotunda um, uh, just to stiffen the building enough. Um, uh, to again that that 0.2 g uh, level of acceleration, but we also had to do quite a bit of steel strengthening of the drum that supports the dome, and um, and some uh, transitions, some uh, transfer inconsistencies that um, actually where we saw dama from the small ground shaking that that 
uh, City Hall did experience from the 89 earthquake. Um, and I'm just gonna really talk to you about um, uh, the isolation. You, do understand that we're we're talking in the early 1990s here you know so this was base isolation was not in the codes um base isolation was not well known and we had to convince a client not only convince the client we had to co convince fema to fund this and what we found we did some modeling so I will show this again, but what you're seeing is um, our three-dimensional um, modeling. Um, on the left, with a fixed base solution, which was a, a braced frame solution, and the right is the, um, is the base isolated building. Um, uh, we're running a real time history, uh, earthquake time history through this. Um, if you, okay, I'm gonna start this again. So if you look at, at the, um, the fixed base building, take a look at the dome and the drum. Take a look at the corners of the building, take a look at the entry pediment right over here. And, and this, is, this is amplified, but nonetheless, it's a, an example of you know, what kind of forces are being exerted and what kind of deformation is happening. And then look at the base isolated building. You'll see that the, the, the dome and the drum were not moving as much. I'll, I'll show this one more time because it's really the best part of my show. Um, but you'll see that you know, these, these corner pediments, the entry pediments, um, are just all moving pretty much monolithically. And, and most importantly, that dome is, is not deforming. Uh, there's very little interstory drift uh, at all. And that's what we're trying to do. This time history was worth 10,000 words to the client that understood what we were doing and why we were doing it. Um, the, the process is what I will, uh, process of installing the isolators was, was really one of the, the real tricks here. I mean, obviously designing, modeling, designing, analyzing was all very important, but we also had to figure out the details about how to get um, the isolators in. And the first part was, was removing the existing foundation, uh, excavating down around the existing plinth of the, of the foundations, uh, putting in the reinforcing steel. You'll also see that the, um, the, the columns had lead base red paint um, on them and those all had to be, be scraped off. Um, uh, and so this was all in the early preparation. Over here in the background, you'll see some pretty hefty um, diagonal uh, uh, steel bracing. That's what we designed in lieu of that rod bracing that we would have gotten had the contractor done it. So, you know, we, I'm not sure we were making or improving the building seismic uh, uh, capacity, but we were certainly keeping it stable if there was a, a moderate um, earthquake during the course of construction. Um, the next slide shows a lot. Uh, the slab is already in. Um, and uh, we have come in, or the contractor has brought in this very stiff armature that is sandwiched on each side of the, uh, the column. You can see, whoops, it went forward too quickly. You can see where the, uh, the paint has been removed. These very stiff girders have been clamped on each side of the column, and they're, they're, they're seated on, um, very stiff beams and then these cylinders are hydraulic jacks and so when we say that we were gonna jack up the building that's kind of what we were doing it was infinitesimal but basically this was working as a load bypass so that so that no longer load was going through the column so that then they could come in and and cut the column here you can see uh, the the preparation work 
for uh, the next column. We only did three columns at a time in each quadrant of the building. And it was very slow work at the very beginning. Um, and then they started uh, uh, picking up speed. The first time we cut a column, we had only 300 people and t uh, uh, TV cameras. Um, I, I have to say it was one of the more nerve wracking time periods, but of course nothing happened. Um, I don't know what people thought was gonna happen. Um, so then this is next in the sequence. The, the column has been cut. Um, the, um, uh, the old foundation has been pulled out, new foundation poured in, and a, um, a setting plate uh, for the isolators uh, was put in. This happens to not always is it one column, one isolator. Um, in this case, you're looking at a um, uh, these are the columns that were transferring the load from the drum that supported the, um, the dome. So there were uh, four isolators here. Then on the, the left-hand side, you can see the isolators already installed. And then on top, um, you're seeing um, what we call the cruciform. It's the beginning of the new floor that is um, over the, uh, the entire isolation plane. Um, uh, the isolators got installed and then the, um, uh, the cruciform steel comes in and then the column gets re-welded, uh, reattached uh, um, to those cruciform shapes. Then last, um, uh, I guess second to last, um, this shows a column, shows the cruciform um, as the beginning of the, the future floor. But I wanted to note one other thing, and that's these plates here. So these were locking plates, and there were four of them on each isolator. Um, the plates were attached by four bolts. And the reason for those was because until we had all the isolators in, until we had the floor in, um, until we had the uh, uh, concrete and metal deck cast, we, we needed that diaphragm intact to load the isolators all uh, uniformly. So these locking plates were put in until we felt satisfied that the, um, uh, that, um, and we actually waited until all of the retrofit work was done on the superstructure. And then we had guys on little flatbeds come in and removing all the plates. I was glad I didn't have to do that. Um, this shows more of the floor framing in. Um, and, and it's an important part of any isolated building. There is this isolation plane, right? And in the case of City Hall, we expected that horizontal movement to be as much as uh, 30 inches. Uh, the moat size was 30 inches. Um, the um, anything that goes across the isolation plane. So any plumbing pipes, any gas lines, uh, and normally uh, elevator pits would would, uh, would have to be able to take that uh, 30 inches of movement, but in the case of uh, City Hall and most isolated buildings, the elevator pits are suspended uh, down. So they're, they're going along with the isolated uh, building. But you can see we had to compete with a lot of plumbing. We also had to make sure by, by the time we were under construction, it was uh, uh, in the code. And we have to be able to uh, inspect, uh, uh, test, uh, and in fact, replace isolators. So we had to design the floor with something like 32 access ports uh, to be able to extract isolators. And by code, we're also required to every five years uh, take an isolator out, take it to a testing facility, uh, and, and making sure that the isolator is still um, uh, uh, um, uh, working appropriately. Um, I wanted to show one other project very quickly. Um, it's also a base isolated building. 
but it's it had a very different um, problem. Actually, it had a lot of problems, um, a lot of challenges, I should say. Um, one of the most unique uh, shapes of a building uh, uh, we've ever worked on. Um, uh, it also utilized a construction delivery methodology called design build, uh, which meant that there was a design team, architect, engineer, and contractor that came in to do the preliminary design up through schematics. They're called bridging documents. Um, and then it was turned over to um, an engineer of record and an architect of record and a new contractor to execute the, the, the design. And, um, and if possible, bring it in at lower the cost. So the decision was made before us uh, to isolate the building. Um, the decision was made uh, by the contractor to use friction pendulums. Um, and, and so we inherited the site conditions, this design build delivery, the, the complex geometry, a very tight uh, project schedule, and, and honestly, one of the most unbuildable building sites I have ever worked on uh, before. But the big issue was, and this is just a, an example of the three-dimensional model of the building, um, the soil structure interaction was a big topic on this, this project, but the issue was the overturning on the isolators. Um, uh, and, you know, very simple uh, uh, pictogram of, you know, how we would get um, overturning uh, on the isolator. Um, uh, this shows um, where we needed to consider the uplift restraints on the isolators. Um, again, the pr friction pendulum, this, this depicts kind of the triple pendulum, kind of the pendulum within a pendulum. Um, and, uh, you know, the pendulum, uh, these little straps were their uplift restraints and um, not sure how well they worked uh, when the pendulum was, was at its full potential excursion. Um, so we identified this problem and said, we have a problem. And it was a problem that the team had to solve. Um, one of my partners, um, Mason Walters, um, uh, took apart his son's roller blades and over the weekend constructed what was the prototype for how he envisioned the uplift restraint. And it was basically this, um, you know, which was not going to be, it was going to be adjacent to the isolator. But so here was something. Um, which we didn't realize we were going to have to solve. And we became uh, research scientists, uh, research engineers, um, mechanical engineers, um, developers, uh, and structural engineers all in one. Um, we, we concocted this. Um, um, I think this is... Um, no, this isn't the, okay, this is a simulation of the testing. I need to give out a big shout out. Uh, I just remembered that this testing was done at UCSD. So anyway, I mean, it's it, it you know they it, it mimicked as best they could um, uh, the three dimensional uh, potential motion, but here you can see the uplift restraint installed. Um, uh, here's the isolator on the left. You'll notice the the um, locking plates still in place. Um, uh, you know, and, and this was the whole mechanism, you know, so when you take on these projects, you know, you never quite know exactly what you're going to have to solve along the way. Again, a strict adherence to the code wasn't going to help you 
really understand what you needed you needed to solve. Um, honestly, this is my favorite picture of the building. This is when the structure was pretty much complete. I think they should have just stopped there. I thought it was a very elegant sculpture at that point. Um, that's the finished building. Um, you know, the, the serpentine shape was bizarre. All right, last, the last project I wanted to talk about, and I could talk about this project as I could City Hall for two days running. And I'm, and I'm really gonna talk about, um, you know, two of what were 12 challenges uh, to this project. Um, it, it was a historic building and, and uh, but, it's, but it's a big challenge was was the fact that it was built right on top of the active Hayward Fault. This is an image from uh, 1915 um, when the when it was under construction. Construction took 10 months um, and cost about a million dollars. Um, there was kind of a natural bowl uh, which the designers wanted to take advantage of. Um, it was the west side of the stadium that was really non-ductile concrete design. You know, you can see even a little bit of a, of a berm. The entire east side was carved into the hillside, so it was not really a, a seismic issue because it's nothing more than a concrete slab on grade. Um, uh, you may know about the, the seismic activity of the um, uh, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, the granddaddy fault is San Andreas fault that, you know, extends all the way down into Southern California. Um, but the fault that we're the most worried about is the Hayward fault because it's the one that is um, uh, more due, in fact, uh, to go off because its mean recurrence interval is a uh, 140 years and the last earthquake was 150 years ago on the Hayward Fault. Um, uh, we did a lot of, you know, kind of studying of the fault uh, to try and understand where it was. Um, uh, we knew that the fault existed because of, you know, this, uh, the creek offsets are a testament to um, uh, the fault rupture or I'm sorry, the fault displacement that's happening. Um, you know, this is a, a geomorphic interpretation and this shows, you know, where they think the fault was and in, in the green, you see what's called the shutter ridge, you know, over geologic time that that has moved in. It's a right lateral fault, you know, so that section in the, in the bottom is, is moving north and the top is moving to the south. Um, and you can see the Strawberry Creek um, and that meandering pattern is exactly, you know, kind of because of the fall creep is how it's reset itself over a geologic time. Um, we, we studied where the fault was doing damage to the building or the fall creep was doing damage, thinking that that might help us a little bit. When I was going to school there, we took field trips up to, you know, look at the the displacement that was happening. I didn't realize years later I would be working on this. Um, it was a very controversial project. The city of Berkeley and the town around it sued uh, the project. Um, there is a state law uh, called Alquis Priolo that uh, prevents uh, the uh, construction of a new building on top of a known active fault. Um, uh, uh, we did have a precursor project, which was a student athlete high performance building, this yellow building, crescent shaped building. So we did a lot of um, trenching um, uh, and, and some where we thought we would find the fault and in some places where we hope we wouldn't find the fault. And in fact, that is in fact what happened. We, we did not find the fault in this footprint, but we, we, we found the fault um, in this particular trench on the south side. Uh, the geotechnical engineers were very excited when they, they mapped this because apparently this line is a, is a very clear indication of the fault. When you see one type of soil 
very different than another kind of soil on, on the other side of a line is a, is a testament to where that, that fault is. Um, so we knew the fault was somewhere around there. Um, and the issue wasn't ground shaking. The issue was fault rupture displacement. And uh, the geotechnical engineers gave us predictions of six feet of horizontal displacement, one to two feet of vertical displacement. So we did uh, a fair amount of research to find out, you know, kind of how had structures been affected by uh, uh, fault displacement. Uh, here was a case where it's more vertical displacement, but it's very interesting how the um, the building above didn't even have broken glass. Um, uh, here was a case from Taiwan, uh, which uh, Professor Sitar uh, from UC Berkeley, uh, slide that he took. There were actually two buildings. Um, uh, the, the building in the foreground collapsed, but these buildings were pile supported because of soil conditions below it. Um, and, and it was the locking in uh, it, into uh, the foundation into the soil, which was its death knell. Here was this Professor Bray, also from Berkeley, um, has this slide he likes to show of a tree trunk uh, where a fault um, ruptured the, uh, the tree trunk. And you can picture the, the, the root system, kind of like a pile system that kind of locked it in. But it, it began to tell us something about having a level, flat, monolithic foundation that was free to slide or rotate might be the right way to go with a very rigid structure above it. So we developed this concept, which was to have on the north and south side relative to where the fault was, a fault rupture block. It would be a, um, a block that would be very rigid and uh, be concrete with sheer walls and be on, a, on a, a four foot thick flat concrete mat slab uh, that would be level on top of um, high plastic, high density plastic sheeting just to give it, you know, enough of a, not frictionless, uh, but at least, you know, some assistance in, in sliding. The main issue was what size was the joint going to be between the adjacent parts of the stadium? Um, and, and by the way, these joints, normal seismic joints in buildings go um, only through the superstructure down to the foundation. In this case, um, the joints would go all the way through the foundation so that this fault rupture block would have its own foundation, you know, and separated from the, the adjacent parts. And so that's basically what we did. Um, we were given very specific likelihood of, of angle of rupture. Um, for where the fault was and what angle it was going to rupture at. And then they gave us different probabilities of multiple faulting and, and where it would be. So we decided that, that we would at least on each side of the fault rupture block uh, put in a thickened slab, uh, at least to help you know, mimic the kind of fault rupture block did the same thing on the south side. And then we went through all sorts of parametric studies that what if the geotechs were wrong and what if we got a rupture outside and we did you know, uh, finite element analysis. We use uh, Abacus um, to analyze this situation. We also actually did a, uh, um, uh, a physical model. It was the suggestion of the seismic review committee um, uh, that was made up of uh, Berkeley uh, structural and geotechnical engineers to confirm uh, the results we were getting from our computer analysis. Um, this is a little animation. Uh, again, we use this with the client to explain to them, you know, what we expected the result to be, you know, this Google fly-in means nothing. And it's really going to be only um, 
uh, the, the last image, uh, it's a little pixelated, but you'll see this block is moving. Here's, here's a better, um, you'll see one last one. We expect these blocks to rotate and maybe tilt a little bit, maybe. This is the best one where you can see the performance. You see where you know we animate the fault rupturing and you can see the rotation and the tilting of, of the block. You know, we worked a long time to determine what seems like a very round number that that joint was go only going to be 12 inches wide. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, because we spent a lot of time talking about seismic pounding. But in this case, the fault rupture happens within the first four seconds of the earthquake. And so we became less adamant that we had to, um, we had to be so uh, um, precise in terms of the size of the joint. If contact was made, we would reinforce those areas of the contact zone so that at least it was life safe. And again, our mandate here was not a high seismic performance, even though we did get the, the question of, can we jack the block back into place after the earthquake? But you know, our, our, our performance goal was life safety. Um, everyone expected that, that for LL Cessor to do some very high tech solution for the fault rupture block. And it turned out to be not so high tech. And we focused so much of our design time on the solution to that because the West Bowl retrofit was like a retrofit of a non-ductile concrete structure. And, you know, kind of smug engineers that we are, actually we're not, but we thought we know how to do this. Well, we really, we really didn't, we found a problem. So this is a cross section through the West Bowl. And, and uh, this cross section um, is, is this triangulated, very stiff bowl structure um, with the perimeter wall out here, which is the historic wall. And then this concrete wall that supports the press box. Okay, so there are four of these, two and two. The press box literally spans from end zone to end zone. So these these cores provide both vertical and lateral support for this two-tier, uh, 320 foot long uh, uh, structure. Original, originally, we thought that these transverse shear walls and these core walls would act together. Um, well, we had a problem and the problem was stiffness compatibility. So what happened first was, was we got, because of the axial stiffness of the bowl slab, we kept getting these raker beams uh, uh, rupturing on us. They were buckling, you know, and we also got a lot of yielding at the, the, the top of these piers. And we said, okay, we know how to deal with that. We'll just in, in, insert a slider down here, um, you know, to kind of uh, release that, that element. Um, uh, and, and we put in uh, s uh, some uh, openings uh, into this. So we put some ductility with some, you know, coupling piers into, into this. So we would get a little energy dissipation. Still, we're not getting what we wanted, you know. So we ended up saying we needed even more ductility. Um, so it was the first time in my professional career we had to talk the architect into putting an opening into our shear wall. Um, so we got a lot more, but we still were fighting, you know, this this stiffness incompatibility. So finally, we decided why are we fighting it, and we separated the two. You know, we put a collar around them, you know, and, and uh, we decided to vertically post tension uh, um, the, uh, the piers to make them into rocking concrete piers. 
um, we put even more energy dissipation in the, the flexural yielding that we got into, into these piers. And then our last maneuver was to use some hydraulic dampers to help dissipate the motion between the piers and uh, the stadium bowl. So where, where everyone expected us to use all the technology into the fault rupture blocks. Instead, we used it all in the, in the, the, the West Bowl. Um, this is another um, uh, little, uh, um, you can see the kind of the differential mo motion of the, of the pier from the very stiff, doesn't stand out as well. Um, that's that's more the the press box. Um, I love slow showing this slide of our the reinforcing of our ductile shear wall um, to engineers back east because they go, oh my god, they've never seen so much reinforcing in their life. Um, uh, the vertical post tensioning. Uh, these were the sleeves. Look at these, um, these uh, number, I think they're number 12 bars, number 11 bars uh, to resist the thrust. And you get a feeling for the scale of this because here's a, is a, is a worker. Um, uh, a couple of construction slides. The, 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 um, overall construction of this project was 20 months. They missed one football season uh, in this. Um, the, uh, the, there was a lot of difficulty uh, in that this is the North Memorial Arch. Every piece of equipment, every piece of material in and out of the building uh, had to go out here. Um, this was on a particularly large mat foundation pour. Uh, where there was a photographic contest to see who could take a, a photograph oh, showing the most concrete trucks. There are 23 in this. Here you can see the, the West uh, Bowl uh, under construction. And there was a reason we accelerated um, the construction of, of this because the press box uh, was going to have to come in later. Uh, uh, here you can see the fault rupture blocks. It was the, the rupture uh, um, uh, joint was at a different, uh, a different angle than the grid, the radial grid of the building, which uh, the architects were very unhappy with, but it was the right thing to do. You can barely today see the uh, this, uh, the distinction of the fault rupture block. So this is the first tier of the press box. So it was uh, fabricated and assembled in Stockton uh, at the fabricators, uh, then taken apart uh, and then trucked into the floor of the stadium and then bolted back together to make sure that it fit. Then they brought in this yellow crane. And then they brought in on 73 fat flatbed trucks, the pieces of this crane that got erected within the bowl. And then that was used to pick up the sections of the press box and, and lift it into place. It actually had a bearing on our design of, of the press box structure, because normally you would have thought that the, the priority would have been for the longitudinal trusses uh, to be the primary element, but these were basically space trusses that had a, a transverse orientation so that they could be assembled in, in, in five block pieces, if you will. You know, a couple more construction photos. This is the um, the the uh, Taylor viscous damper um, that sandwich uh, around at the third level uh, um, between the bowl and the um, 
uh, the vertical cores. And this shows the finished the finished photograph of the foreground, the student athlete high performance building, the precursor project, and in the background, the the historic wall, which was frankly the only thing we we saved uh, of the existing structure, and then the new press box above. And the football team has won very few football games since this new stadium, but. Um, Then last but not least, my last slide is um, during my career, you know, we all stay pretty involved in uh, ASCE, CSI, CIONC, you know, my, my volunteerism was mostly in EERI. That's where um, I, I decided to get the most involved. I highly, highly recommend um, whether you're in practice or you're in academia, being involved in professional associations, um, not only not only do you meet the smartest people, you meet the nicest people, and it, it really leads you to um, a lot of, about um, collaboration. Uh, I also got involved in a lot of civic and community nonprofits that, you know, I think made me a more well-rounded engineer. So that's my presentation. Um, I, I hope I can wake you all up now. Um, it's, it's hard not being able to see all of you during the, the course of, uh, of a presentation, but, um, Again, I've, I've loved my career. I feel very lucky and blessed to have been able to work on some really fun and challenging uh, uh, projects um, along, along the way. So if you have uh, um, any, any questions, I would, I would love to um, see if I can answer them. And I think, Khalid, you are going to... Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for uh, for this great presentation and uh, sharing all the experiences and the challenges that are inherent in this profession. So we have a couple of questions. Um, the first question is regarding uh, the San Francisco City Hall. So how did you get the properties of the existing San Francisco City Hall? Did you use any kind of testing like uh, operational model analysis or something to get the period of that structure? Well, we, we, we did uh, quite a lot of testing. Um, you know, so um, I could probably spend an hour on this topic alone. Um, there's a couple of things we did. Um, uh, uh, a lot had to do with in-situ testing of, of the existing materials. Um, uh, some at, the, at the, the, the ground floor level. So C.H. Snyder was the engineer for the new city hall. And since he was the engineer right after the 1906 earthquake, he did know something about, about earthquake engineering. Um, he actually intentionally designed a soft story as a fuse. Um, and um, uh, instead of using brick walls um, uh, in the ground story, he used terracotta. Um, and so we had to test the, the, the terracotta, even though we knew we were going to be removing it all there, but there was terracotta throughout the building. There was terracotta um, around the stairwells. Um, terracotta was a very uh, common product uh, that was used for um, fire resistive kind of wall assemblies. Um, uh, we also tested all of the brick um, because a lot of the brick we weren't removing uh, um, uh, throughout the building. Um, I mentioned that we used a shot crete application uh, in the light court, but a lot of the brick um, around the historic perimeter of the building we were going to leave put. So we were very interested in, 
um, in the in situ properties of the brick and and the mortar um, and the concrete um, uh, uh, throughout the building. Then we um, we put all of those um, uh, capacity values into the into the model that we had, um, and and um, we we ran the Loma Prieta earthquake through the model um, to you know with you know with the the fixed base building you know the you know the building as is to see if we could get a correlation between the damage that we observed. And, and what the, the, the computer analysis would tell us. And we got very good correlation on that. There was also a great deal of other material testing. I mean, this was an old building and the, um, the inner dome of, of the building was suspended from a grillage of, um, of, of steel. Um, with with the, the the plaster being hung by a combination of plaster of Paris and horsehair, so the question was: Were we going to replace all of that? And after some testing, the historic architects convinced us that if we didn't need to replace it because it didn't have the capacity, then then we should leave it alone. So. We did a lot of material testing and a lot of it to also um, make sure we understood, you know, what the, we, we didn't completely supersede um, with the base isolation and the, uh, the shot creep. We didn't super street su seed the existing capacity, either vertical or lateral of some elements of the building. So does that help? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the answer. I think that's very clear now. Uh, um, so we have another question regarding the San Francisco City Hall. So it is related to the the 30 inch moat wall distance relates to what seismic hazard? Is it a two percent in 50 years? It was. It was um, the the maximum credible earthquake. Okay. So is the deformation, the actual deformation under the maximum credible earthquake was, um, was 28 inches. So 30 inches sounded like a nice round number. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so you know, one way, if I can, I can just use that, you know, um, you know, kind of the, the, uh, uh, the performance specification uh, for the procurement of the isolators because the isolators were competitively bid. Um, uh, but um, uh, there, um, you know, we knew what the design basis deformation was. We knew what the maximum credible uh, earthquake deformation was. Uh, uh, not all of the 538 isolators were um, were tested to that kind of deformation. Um, they're all tested to a uh, uh, production uh, deformation, which was the uh, design basis earthquake deformation, which I believe was um, was 17 inches. Um, you know, and you know the, the the purpose of all of the prototype testing was not only to to test that displacement, but also to um, uh, to test the um, bonding between the uh, the rubber and steel plates. Um, and early on, we did get. Uh, some failures, some production failures, and and some of the things that that happened was kind of interesting. Was if if the rubber wasn't wasn't uniformly uh, uh, the same thickness, um, we ended up getting tearing in the rubber. Hmm. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for the answer. And uh, there is another question, but it is uh, very general regarding the building code. Uh -huh. So, uh, have there been any updates in building codes recently in Alameda County to mitigate potential damage or a seismic event along the Hayward Falls? Um, I can't think of anything specific to the Hayward Fault. I mean, the you know one of the uh, one of the the lessons from Kobe, Japan. Kobe, Japan, physically is a lot like the East Bay. I mean, in terms of the terrain and um, the proximity of the fault to to the bay, or in, in Kobe's case, the harbor. Um, but one of the the interesting learnings from the Kobe earthquake was uh, near fault response. And I think you know that that following Kobe, following a couple of years, there was there was much more um, written into the code about um, you know within you know two to ten kilometers of of designing for um, near fault pulse kinds of effects. So I would say that's particularly relevant to um, uh, to the Hayward Fault then is particularly relevant to all of the projects we, we have done and continue to do and all engineers do um, on the UC Berkeley campus. It's also true for projects on the, on the uh, Stanford campus relative to their proximity to the uh, San Andreas Fault. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So the next question is regarding the stadium. So for the stadium, are there any instruments on site monitoring the structure for future earthquakes? Oh, th that question is kind of a dagger to my heart. You know, it's kind of hard. No, no there is no seismic instrumentation of Memorial Stadium. Uh, um, I, I, I wish there was. There certainly is. Um, uh, on every base isolated building there is in San Francisco City Hall because that's actually a requirement. But um, um, uh, there is in the state of California a strong motion instrumentation program. Um, uh, but there's, a, um, there's some weird law that prevented that program from funding the, um, uh, the instrumentation of, of Memorial Stadium. So we tried to uh, convince the campus uh, that it would be really important um, to uh, instrument the building. We got a lot of support from the um, civil and environmental engineering department, as I bet you could you could probably understand, because they they like treating their buildings on campus as uh, living learning laboratories, and um, uh, um, unfortunately, we were told that if if we wanted to do it, we'd have to come up with the money. And uh, right now, uh, as I'm sure your campus understands, there isn't a lot of money coming from the state in general for higher education. <laughs> and, and so um, we still do not have Memorial Stadium instrumented. Thank you. Uh, so the other question is uh, a student uh, saw the, the, the steel plates that connect the two parts of the stadium on a field walk led by Professor Sitar. So or his question is, did the design consider an allowable fault deformation value? And what is the li design lifespan of, for that project? Um, I'm not sure I can honestly answer the first part of the question. Um, uh, um, I, I, uh, I'll have to get back to you. I will. I will try and get an answer. Um, uh, you know, in in terms of um, the life cycle of this design, um, uh, 
uh, I think it goes, I think for the fault rupture blocks, it goes, you know, I, I think the stadium will be fine after an earthquake, even after a, a maximum credible earthquake. We didn't design this building as a high performance seismic performer, but uh, you know, it, you know, it is certainly a very good code design. Um, I, I, I think the, uh, um, there could well be damage uh, to um, the concrete after a, um, a severe event. Um, I think it would be repairable damage. Um, so, you know, when I get a question about, you know, how long would, will this building last? I mean, normally we think about a co-designed building as, as lasting 50 years, you know, and maybe that has to do with a lot of, you know, non-structural elements of the building, you know, of how long can, can the skin of the building last or the precast or um, how long can um, steel go without rusting even if protected, you know, but, you know, I, I do think that more and more we think of buildings of having hundred year lives um, you know, but I think whenever I, I think about the life expectancy of a building that I've worked on, I think about its, um, you know, its, its seismic resistance and how is it going to do after an earthquake, um, you know, and I, I, I would say that Memorial Stadium will, will have a better than code performance and would likely be uh, repairable within a reasonable period of time. Thank and you. if that and if that fault rupture block actually moves, I think I think I'd I'd leave it alone. So there is another question regarding the 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 fail safe mechanism in the in a base isolation building. So if if during an, during an event, if, if the isolators are teared or they are broken. So how do you consider that scenario? Like, uh, I think the question is about the fail-safe mechanism. Um, you kind of have two choices. You know, in the case of San Francisco City Hall, um, uh, I mean, the, the real worry about the failure of a, um, uh, of at least an elastic Merrick isolator in terms of how could it fail? It could fail by rolling over. That is, that its uh, translational capacity is exceeded. So, you know, that it, it, it gets um, inelastically moved beyond its, its uh, 30 inch deformation design, deep, uh, MCE design capacity. So, you know, in the, in the, in the case of, of City Hall, we designed the isolators to that MCE um, uh, dis distortion displacement. You know, so, so it, it didn't have a fail safe, but it's, its factor of safety is, is in all the bearings being designed so that they cannot roll over or that'd be highly unlikely. So the other thing you could do is, is design all of the isolators for a DBE displacement and then put a steel catchment. Um, and we've done that as a fail safe on, on a couple of buildings, on a couple of new buildings. Um, uh, uh, the city of San Francisco has an uh, emergency operations center where they put the um, isolation plane above the parking um, uh, be below the building. So the, uh, uh, the isolators are up on concrete uh, columns and the columns have outriggers and uh, sitting on the outriggers is a um, uh, a uh, steel plinth that is approximately 
a half an inch uh, um, below the depth of the isolator. So if the isolators roll over, they are caught. The building essentially is caught by this assemblage of catchments. So that's the fail safe in, in, in that case. Thank you. Um, with this, I just uh, want to make note of the time we're, we're approaching uh, 2.30. So we kind of blended the, the in-depth project discussion with the presentation. And uh, I just um, said I have quite a number of people online. So thank you everyone for, for sticking around. Um, but I don't know, David, if you need a break or anything. Um, I'm, I'm okay. I, I still have some water, so I'm, I'm fine. Okay. Right, yeah, so if any, anybody has more questions, feel free. <laughs> I, I have a question. I have a, a question. Please, please. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, please, you can ask. Uh, I can ask it. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask on the, on the isolation system when looking at the uh, San Francisco City Hall, you said the MCE displacement was about, uh, well, it was 28 inches, but you designed it for, for 30. Um, the, the, moat, the moat was designed for 30 inches. For, for 30. And then when you look at the new, one of the latest buildings in San Francisco, I don't know the proximity or how close it is to the, both of these are say close to say the San Andreas Fall or any other seismic hazard around there. Like the Apple Center was like, what is it, like um, 50 inches or something like that, 40, 45 inches. And so there's been kind of this, in, there seems to be this increasing trend in the displacement requirements for isolated buildings. Right. Uh, and I noticed that uh, over, over time. And is that due to the more knowledge on the seismic hazard or uh, changing design guidelines? I don't, or I don't know if you, ever, if you noticed that trend. Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm trying to to think of. Um, uh, um, I have. I, I agree with you. I have heard of um, displacements, particularly using the the friction pendulum, that that is, um, you know, kind of above four feet. I think you just mentioned 51 inches. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I um, I don't know if there is a practical physical limitation uh, on on the the elastomeric isolators. I have not been involved with a project that has pushed an, an elastomeric isolator much beyond 36 inches. Um, uh, I have been hearing of much bigger displacements on friction pendulums. And I don't know enough to know if there's something about, you know, kind of physically the bigger uh, friction pendulum can take those kinds of, you know, increased displacements. You know, um, I, I wonder a little bit about, um, you know, even if the isolators can take that kind of displacement. Remember I mentioned about anything that crosses the isolation plane mm -hmm. has to have, be able to have that kind of, of, you know, kind of, you know, snaking motion, you know, about it, you know, and I remember how much the mechanical engineers were screaming at us for 30 or 36 inches of, 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 of flex in, in their piping connections to have to deal with um, moat covers for 51 inches. Or I, I think there is a, there may be a practical limit on how, you know, how some of the non-structural systems can accommodate that kind of motion. I think Apple Park is one of the examples like the- Which one? Apple Park, Apple's new headquarters. Yeah. Yeah, those are all friction pendulums. So yeah, that could be, um, uh, yeah, I don't, I actually don't know that much about that project. Um, I have a general question about like why the application in US is very 
limited as compared to Japan or other countries? Why? I'm sorry. I, I, why there are fewer number of base isolation buildings in the U.S. as compared to Japan, or was that a, a reference to the code? Um, it is a reference to the code as well. Like, uh, are the requirements very stringent here as compared to Japan that we see less application of base isolation because there is a lot of uh, base isolation buildings in Japan, and uh, in some countries I know, like. Um, in, uh, I don't know about the US code right now, but in, in Turkey, the in Istanbul, every hospital has to be base isolated. The new requirements are. So I'm framing that question in the international context. Like, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm not gonna speak to the differences in the codes because I, I don't really know the differences um, in the codes. Uh, that much or whether or not the Japanese code is um, a little, it wouldn't surprise me that the Japanese code is, is a little less restrictive than the US code. Um, so I'm a big believer in seismic isolation. I think it's the best anti-seismic system that we structural engineers have. Um, and for essential services buildings, I think, you know, there's, there's nothing better. You know, um, I think it's very interesting that Apple decided to choose isolation for, for their spaceship. Um, um, I find it increasingly frustrating that, um, that we don't have more base isolated buildings in this country. Um, uh, I find it remarkable that we're not um, as committed to seismic resilience as I think we should be. And we're gonna learn way too late um, you know, about, about that. Um, I, I blame a little bit um, the developer. You know, I think, I think you know, kind of um, base isolation, the, the question that I get from architects or, um, or developers all the time is, what's the premium for base isolation? So if you have a developer who's building a building who, who is interested in the lowest first cost development of their project, that's where this question comes from. The question is, you know, is what's the premium? You know, and so I always try and answer it, you know, kind of, well, you know, if, if you know, you're, if you're doing a base isolation retrofit, you know, the premium is you got to tuck these isolators in, you know, and you got to create an isolation plane and you got to create a new floor, you know, so it's not just the isolators themselves. I said a better way of thinking of it is a new building, you know, the new building, okay, you have the isolators, you got to offset that with the reduction in superstructure bracing. You do have to buy that extra floor diaphragm. So, you know, if you might have had a first floor slab on grade, you're going to be, you know, building up um, the isolators on top of that, a new first floor. But if you are, are willing to consider for one moment, the life cycle costing of the structure, you know, and, and the fact that you won't have to repair the building nearly as much afterwards, you know, there's no comparison, you know, but, but you know, if you look at, at um, how the, the Japanese since Kobe have, have taken off, I mean, it's, it's like, a hundredfold the number of base isolated buildings they have. I mean, I I was working for with an architect, a Japanese architect, on a project in um, in California that unfortunately never got built. But he base isolated all of his buildings because it gave him the freedom to do the kind of architecture he wanted to to do, you know, and and um, 
you know, I think I am beginning to see, you know, a little bit more the, the biotech world, the higher education world, you know, be much more open to high performance structural engineering. I, I sit on the Stanford Seismic Advisory Committee and I've been pushing seismic resilience for the five years that I've been on it. And I told them that I'm not coming off the committee until Stanford has a base isolated building. That, that's, that's good to know, like you are pushing them to, to do the base isolation. We have another comment from a student from Chile, and he, he also mentions that base isolation is required in Chile for hospitals, like it is a must thing. Yeah. And uh, there's, there is one more question. So when you decided to make a hole in that transfer shear wall under the press box, what other configurations did you consider to increase the ductility? What other configurations of shear wall? Well, by 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 the time that we um, uh, um, put in the the coupling links, you know, and we were fine tuning all of the other elements that we were we were working on, um, you know, we we were we were pretty happy with you know the configuration that we had. Thank you. Um... Is there okay. Um, yeah, I was going to suggest maybe we should take like just a, a short break, at least for five minutes. And then okay. um, for all the students too that are on board, I think one of the next things we were going to do is we wanted to give a presentation. Um, and I think that there'll be Mike Morano on the um, shake table. So for the students that are um, online, we could continue the discussion, but it also I think be a good opportunity to hear what's going on with the, with the, with the shake table. Um, but one thing we did forget, and, and you know, uh, is to, um, it's hard in a virtual world, but uh, first of all, thank you for, for, the, for the excellent presentation, uh, David. Um, I think, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of st students stuck around. Uh, we had, I think, over 70 participants at, at, at some point, um, most of th throughout the first hour, at least, and, you know, there's class conflicts and other things that, that prevent students from staying longer. Um, but I really want to thank you for, for, for the excellent presentation and for, um, for coming out to, uh, or in the virtual sense, to UCSD. And we do hope to have you on campus uh, sometime soon and, uh, and sh show your own campus. Great. I'd love to come. Yes, the, the chat, chat box is full of uh, thanks, thanks for you uh, for yeah. the presentation. Great. Okay. Thank you. I'll take. Okay. Just offer a virtual applause. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I miss. I miss seeing all the faces. But. But. Thank you. <laughs>